Good morning. I think we are at the afternoon mark. Uh, now, good afternoon. <laughs> and praise the Lord. Um, it's really nice to see you here. Uh, please receive greetings from my husband. He would have really loved to be here with us today, but um, there's an engagement that one of us urgently needed to, uh, to take care of, so we sacrificed him for, for that. Yeah, but I am glad to be here with you, and it's really nice to see the people of that service. Um, when I was here, we used to call this the um, after-hour service, because, I mean, most people would, uh, it, it would be the service that most people came from, especially ministry, people who are in ministries. They would come for, for the times that they are not serving so that they can have it easy and relax. So I hope that you are nicely um, refreshed for this time. We are doing a Bible study this semester from the book of Philemon and Titus. And the titling is Grace Leading to Obedience. So in the next few minutes, we'll be talking a lot about obedience and grace. Um, but we'll start it in four parts in how grace and obedience is seen in leadership, in discipleship, in stewardship, and in fellowship. And then we'll be closing. Uh, so you can just turn with me to the book of Titus. It's a small little page, uh, rather a small little letter that uh, Paul wrote to Titus. And then after that, we'll be jumping to Philemon, which is the page right after that. So just open Titus and stay right there. We'll be in it in a few minutes. Now, as I think about obedience, do you always have it easy? Um, like knowing what you need to do and actually doing it. Do you find sometimes that you have been called to set yourself apart, to be sort of alienated from your formal wa former ways, from things that you used to do before, and now you're being called into an obedience that sounds a bit difficult? I'm going to ask you, has your salvation led you to a difficult but necessary sacrifice? Has it? You can know if it has. If yours has led you to any difficult but necessary um, sacrifice, if you had to, for some people, they have had to detach from friends um, because of the obedience call that God has given them. Some people have had to close, um, take fasts from social media where places of temptations lie. Some people have had to, uh, you know, put themselves out for more accountability and all that in, the, in light of obedience. Although some people have also had to do a culture change. For some of us, where we exist and the people around us, they do not promote the kind of calling God is calling us to, the obedience in the daily. For maybe it could be the opposition is great, or rather, the amount of um, transformation that you need to, to have requires you to separate yourself or even move from that culture altogether, which is also difficult sometimes. But for some of us, our invitation to obedience actually includes forgiving someone you would rather not. You would rather they stay where they are, very far away from your life, without ever um, seeing them or hearing from them again. In fact, if you had a way, you would have the world open up and swallow somebody uh, just so that you will never have to deal with forgiving them. Yet God calls us to an obedience. So what has been your story in God inviting you to obedience and what inv invitations are you getting? Um, but next question I want to ask you, where do you go to for when those seasons where God is calling you to a, a very radical obedience? Where do you go to for support? Who is in your corner? Who supports you? Who tells you keep pressing on in the faith? If you have someone who's keeping you accountable and helping you stay in the faith, register for Bible study this semester and attend fully. If you don't have someone who's keeping you accountable in the faith, please register for Bible study and stay in it fully. And if you are unsure whether or not you need somebody, 
you need to register for Bible study urgently, like today, today. And don't, like, don't leave the room before you are sure you have, you have your group and you are all sorted. And if you had not committed yourself to um, stay in Bible study, please, I hope I can persuade you that you cannot exist by yourself, but we need this kind of support. So our obedience is going to be lived out in realities, in a context of a world where people do not value the honor of God. It is not fashionable anymore. It is not fashionable for people to trust, you know, to, to have integrity. It is not, why, why would I do that when someone else can sign for me the class list? Why would I want to go all the extra mile and, you know, like just be right with God? For what reason? It's not fashionable anymore. But second, there are deceptions. For those that have, convinced, have gotten conviction, there are deceptions around us that can be very alluring. When the enemy is whispering right to your ear, did God really say that? Does he mean it? Or does he mean like we repent right now and not do it? Or does he like give us one grace card, we'll repent a bit later in the afternoon probably? Or just a little bit. It's not the whole scene, it's just a portion of it. Deceptions like that, that can be alluring and pretty, pretty attractive and addictive. But the other bit, I was talking with someone uh, before they left um, for the second service, and they were asking me, what is wrong? Why would God want to put us with all us, especially we who are very intentional about our obedience? Why would he put us in a difficult world? Why doesn't he just like create a Christian center where we are all very obedient, very happy, no temptation, no sin, no nothing? I told him he has that, but it is not he in this side of heaven. It's on the other one. But he does put us in a world where we are not of the world, even though we are in it. So there's constant um, desire that you would grow in, you know, like becoming um, like God. You are saved for a present time like this, not alienated, but then being invited to devote yourself to obedience to God. And those are some of the realities that you will see as we deal with the scripture that we are talking about today. So um, Titus chapter 1, hope you're still there. Um, as, as Paul starts his letter, he says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords to godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word, through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. To Titus, my true child, in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. So he is basically drawing an introduction to his letter to Titus. And this man, Paul, is the same one that writes the rest of the epistles, aside from the ones written by other people. Paul starts by asserting whom he is. He has the habit of doing this, especially when he is about to um, like just lay it on you hard. And he starts this with, I am a servant of the Lord God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And which God are we talking about? Not your false gods, the false gods of the Cretans. No wonder he says um, that God who never lies, and like the Cretan gods where Titus was going to do ministry at, who are deceiving and wicked and liars and manipulative, Paul is calling their attention to one great God who never lies, who has thought, who has promised us eternity, and who has promised this from time immemorial, and he's entrusting Paul to share his word. So Paul is about to lay it down heavy, so he needs to assert his authority. But says something that triggers my mind, that his mandate is to share the knowledge of truth so that godliness may take full effect in our lives. And we'll be seeing how this um, flows out. And he speaks to Titus. To Titus, he starts with, Titus, my true child in a common faith. You have lived in a home. Your parents, do they call you my true child? 
Do your sisters, do you turn to them and look at them? My true sister, my true brother. The only time you probably call somebody your true anything is probably maybe a friend or someone who's a bit distanced from you. Because in a family, you would expect every one of you is legitimately in there. They have no reason to be questioned why they are true or false. Your friends, you can have doubts sometimes, but the person who you got out together on the, from the same womb, you would probably not call them. So, what Titus is, um, I feel that when Paul is saying, is calling Titus and referring to him as his true child, is a reminder of who Titus is and who is this guy. So Titus is a Gentile, a Gentile who came to faith um, after receiving um, God's word from Paul. So Paul calls him a true child because he is legitimately his. He is legitimately in the faith regardless of him not being a Jew by birth. And to Titus, his invitation is, I have left you in Crete so that you may put in order what remains to order and appoint leaders in every town as I directed you. So this is the work that this guy is going to do. And we're going to see the expanse of his work as we think about leadership, um, discipleship, and, and stewardship. Let's zoom in a little further about on these Cretans and this place where Titus is being left at, to do ministry at. So Titus is being charged by Paul to stay as a ministry, as a pastor, we will call him a bishop, an elder, an overseer in Crete. Crete is an island in the Greek. It's like a long stretch. It still exists right now. But this place is full of people who are wicked and deceitful but very, very deceitful. You know streets in town where when you go, you, can, you need to check even if your heart, your kidneys, everything is present because it is likely to go, not just your phone. People are likely to pass with other things that you didn't even imagine they can steal. And so Titus is being called to a place like this where there's a lot of deceitfulness from all angles, from the people who look like believers, from the non-believers, from the gods, like, it's chaos, it's dramatic. Everybody is finding a way of inventing sin and living in it and staying like that. So, but even here, at the height of sin, God has his own elect that he has set apart. People that are consciously honoring God in here. And that is to whom people is interested that they will be in order. They will find, you know, like order and obedience and they will stay in it. And in this place, in the wickedness of this place, we see God's mercy even to his church. Now, for this church, Timothy, Titus, sorry, Titus is supposed to elect leaders. And he gives um, these three instructions about the leaders, the elders that are supposed to be elected there. And he starts with what their homes ought to look like. The obedience of these elders, their testimony is not to be said out publicly, but it's to start first in their homes, whether they are subordinate, whether their wives and their children are people who are not charged with debauchery or in subordination, but are people who are living the testimony. Because these people, these people that are supposed to be leaders, they have a doctrine and a truth in them, and the, the way they are living out the gospel can be seen by the people whom they influence every other day. Some of us have a very difficult time preaching to our siblings at home because they know us. Because they know our faith could probably be just a public thing. Every other person thinks you are a solid, serious believer. They think you read, your, you do your devotions very frequently. They see your good works and they admire you. But here at home where people know you, is the testimony still sure? And Titus is being told that the testimony of the leaders that were supposed to be appointed have, has to be like very sure in the hearts of the people that, in the homes that they live in. So then your most important church, the people that you are most interested and needing your influence, the gospel influence, are the ones at home. 
Second bit, he says that um, because these people are going to manage God's people and God's household, they must restrain from being overbearing. They must restrain from being quick-tempered or drunkard and this of, of pursuing dishonest gain. It's not that the opportunities for doing all these things are not there. They are plenty. It's great we are talking about. Instead, these leaders are supposed to distinguish themselves in this way, to have self-control that, you know, just restrained from urges that would push you towards sin. They are supposed to actually actively demonstrate self-control. They're also supposed to be upright, People who are sober for what they are being called to, they, their duty is clear, their minds are clear, these people cannot be reproached. But also they're supposed to be holy in, no, in acknowledging that they have flesh, they're waging war against their flesh, they are diligent in putting on the spirit and laying down their flesh. But they are to keep in this, in, there's to stay disciplined as in rigorous training to righteousness, beating their bodies daily, saying no, being thankful to God, just disciplining themselves that they may honor God. These people are to distinguish themselves in that. An important thing that Paul also says is that they must hold fast to the trustworthy word as taught the trustworthy word of God as it has been taught without adding or subtracting to it because this is sufficient for the encouragement, for the empowering of the believers, even for the response to the non-believer and the opposer. The word of God as it is, they are supposed to maintain its fidelity to be conscious of it. Paul is not expecting these leaders to be strange human beings. He is literally expecting that every person will be handling their lives like this so that when the appointment of leaders come, we are not like having a few options that probably this one has two or not two, but he is expecting that they will live like this. And we'll be seeing that in a moment. Because these leaders that were being appointed from verse 10 uh, of chapter 1, you will see that they are being appointed to be elders in Crete that deceitful dark creed where other people who just enemies of the, of the work of God found their ways into the church and found, started deceiving people claiming that you are not born again, you are not practicing Judaism, you are not following the ways of this, you are not keeping in this law, you are not legalistic. And they would start even pursuing dishonest gain. They would... Um, be like our local preachers who would um, call you to send this gift, this person number rolling here, and they will unlock your prosperity. Send it again so that I can unlock a little bit more prosperity. No, you did not send enough, so your prosperity only unlocked 70%. They would do like that. If your prosperity is, if things are keeping locked, so we would wonder who, who is that malicious that is, what kind of God is that that is maliciously just locking your lives every other place and you need to, you know, unlock it with a special, in a special way. And these are the people that um, these elders are to deal with on a very frequent place. And in response to this, he gives them um, Paul responds and gives two suggestions for how to deal with them. For the fellowship, for the believers, he says, rebuke the believers sharply so that they will be sound in faith and they will pay no attention to Jewish myths or, or the merely human commands. That his, his suggestion for how do we maintain the fidelity in the, among the believers is that the believers will be, you know, they'll be enriched with God's word so that they will not have any business with the liars and the deceitful people. But he also says in chapter 3, verse 9, how to respond to the opposers as a recommendation for Titus. Avoid these foolish controversies and genealogies with them. But he says, verse 10, if, you, if one is around you, warn them once. And then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them so that you may be sure those people are warped and sinful. They are self-contempt. Paul also goes ahead to tell Tim, Titus their needs to be order in terms of the discipleship of whole homes. 
chapter 2 verse 1 starts with but as for you teach what accords to sound doctrine now teach what should come out what should bear effect in people responding to sound doctrine and this is what he is calling people to some people have argued about Titus chapter 2 and saying that people are being deflated, they are being called into a defeat of believers, but no, he is calling them to a richness of sound doctrine, a richness of obedience that is not just for them, but even for their own lookers. You remember the people are in Crete. Hear what um, um, Titus has to do for these six groups. Um, for the older men, because of sound doctrine, because of the sound teaching of the Lord, our God, and, and, the, the, uh, and his son, Jesus Christ, these older men are to be temperate, toned down, not um, overloading on other people, but they are to be steadfast in love with, with self-control and sound in faith. He says that because that will make this, this would be a result and outworking of the work of God in their lives. For the older women, they are being invited to be reverent, not given to much wine or much drinking or gossip, you know, or even just demolishing of the homes of people, but they are to have reverence. They have to, they are to, they're being invited to a calmness and a quiet spirit that will show the sound doctrine to whom, to which they subscribe. These older women are given the mandate to teach the younger women what he says in, um, in verse 4, and, and to, to teach them to love their husbands and their children, generally to be nurturing. Now, nurturing is not a value that very many people want in this kind of time. And the Cretans also thought the same. They would consider a lady who is independent, unmarried, and desire of, of family and children because they are going to derail them. They are most, they didn't necessarily have professional boss lady kind of settings, even though there were merchants and all people around. But they just thought it fashionable for ladies to not be burdened with care for anybody, reckless with their way of handling their families, abandoning their children and their husbands on account of it is tedious for me. But this, he, see what Paul desires of them? That there will be nurture, that there will be constant love, that these ones will give themselves to gracefully, lovingly take care of their homes, take care of the people in their homes. And Paul also writes to the young men. Those young men are told one thing, which is a very difficult thing as well. It may be one doesn't look like a really long list, like the one the younger women are supposed to do, and it's not unfair. It's still the instruction that Paul gave to these Cretans. You are, we were not there, so we really don't know why they needed to uh, be told that. But he was told that. They're told that. They're told to be of self-control. They are told to refrain themselves from urges and pursuing their will, their willful, you know, desires. They're told to manage their passions, build them under the lordship of Christ and have self-control. A difficult task as it may, especially if you consider the adventurous nature of young men. Paul also encourages Titus with saying that he also has a role in the discipleship of the community. He is to show himself in all respects to be a model of good works. It says that in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. The Titus is not to go around and not show out works as well, but he is to be a model for the teaching, for the integrity, and for, their spe for his speech. He is also to be accountable for his own obedience. He does another group and tells them, slaves be subordinate and trustworthy. Now, these slaves that are being invited towards being subordinate and trustworthy are people who have become, come to the faith. Now, they could have started a riot and, you know, um, condemn people for the evil of slavery, and that would have also helped them to kill slavery completely. 
but it is Crete we are talking about, where if you come with your loud noise, they overwhelm you with an even louder noise. So Paul's comment and his, his admonition for these um, slaves was that because of the doctrine, because of what accords to sound doctrine, they are to be subordinate. They are to honor their masters. They are to be a distinguished type of workers that even though for a little while they are in slavery, their, their masters will be won over and gradually slavery will be completely diminished, which actually did happen. As Paul is writing this about discipleship, he's, he makes very sharp comments in three ways. Verse 5, he says, do this so that no one will malign the word of God, so that the word of God will not ever be caught in fault, because you are honoring the, the Lord. You are showing it in the way of your life. You are showing it's being revealed, and people can see the goodness of God. People can see his faithfulness, his trustworthy, even his character in your works so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. He says that to Timothy, to Titus in verse 8, that those that are opposing you, those that are looking forward to your downfall, they have nothing to say of it because there's nothing, there's no content because you are walking in a way that shows integrity and dignity in your speech and in everything because of that nobody can find fault in you. But the ten, verse 10 says, um, so that in every way, they will make, now sing to the slaves, they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. The desire is that those that are looking at your works will be won over to the Lord. They will see the attractiveness of our faith and fellowship. They will see our, the attractiveness of our alienation Alienation looks uncool for a little while until they keep seeing it every day and every time. And that type of lifestyle looks different. They start desiring you. Probably should consider um, how the, a, a, a lifestyle that actually draws your non-believing roommates and neighbors towards seeing a, consistently, a, a, a consistent application of obedience that attracts them to the Lord. In stewardship, you can read chapter 3 from verse 3 to 8. <clears throat> and Paul says that at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of our God, our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things he had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, by whom he, whom he poured on, out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and, oh, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have, trust, who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Listen to what he also says in chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. In response to why we need to do this, why a sound doctrine has us demanding obedience from us, 
is because of this. He starts with pointing, you and I were the wicked people that we read about in scripture. You know when you read uh, through Galatians and you see all the condemned people and they are least like, wow, these people are bad. That was you and I. That was us. The people that you look around and you think, hey, these ones cannot go to heaven. This ones, if they are going to heaven, they must be left over, you know, space fillers or something. That was you and I. We were not even Jews by birth. We were like really far away. We were far from it. And we were objects of wrath because of a holy God who, who would be very holy to not stand our sin. And he does something. He gives us his great mercy, not because he, we deserve it, not from any righteous acts that we did, but because he chose to. He did choose to do that. And he gives us his mercy and calls us to him. He makes us call heirs with him. He, our debt is paid in full, and we are made just with God by his grace. Our wickedness was crazy, and we were in slaves. We were slaves to wickedness, you guys. We were lost. We were not people who were, you know, like, even cut out for anything. We were far from it. Human terms said we were never going to get this. We were never going to have a fellowship like this. But God, in his great mercy, our redemption was expensive. It took the Son of God very expensive but also very undeserved, but a work of grace by God himself. So as a response to those that thought that I may not be very saved, I did not do this thing that people did when they were born again, I did not say this very long prayer, nobody put their hands on me, nobody um, threw water on me, I did not get circumcised at the point of my salvation, and he says this to them, you were justified by grace. You did not need that. It, because Christ said it is finished, it is finished, it was finished at all. But then God keeps doing this work of rebirth and renewal through the Holy Spirit. And that is what the grace to say no to all unrighteousness. In this godly age, he does that. He renews you. He makes you able to obey him. Even now when the situations are hard. Even now when the pressures are many. Even now when the temptations are always too near. You really don't need to go very far to look for a temptation to sin. You just need to shake your head a little bit. You find many options for what you can do to dishonor God. Sometimes not even shake your head, just blink. You find it. And the end goal for this grace that brings salvation that has appeared, calling, helping us to say no, to, rec to renounce sin, it is for our devotion to God and to, this, uh, to, to the good works that he has prepared for us. It is our devotion to showing the world what our Christian life should be like. Because we are thankful like that. So painful in a little while. Though right now we may have to endure that embarrassment of being the only one. Or even the loneliness and isolation which is un bearable, though painful in a little while, in the near time, in the soon to come time, we will see our Lord God. We have this great hope in eternity where we are with Christ and all our burdens, all this little strain that we had to endure right now makes full sense. So the order of our good works is not we randomly wake up and decide, I am tired of being bad. I should probably do a few good things and keep doing them every other time. Not quite. If you're doing that, please reconsider. Reconsider this option. We are first aware that we are very far. I'm, I'm really insisting about how far we are because most of us, we don't fully always remember how privileged we are to be recipients of the gospel. We're very far, but God had mercy on us and he is working a transformation by the gospel in our lives every day. And because that transformation is taking full effect, we are walking in obedience, showing good works for the glory of God out of humility and thankfulness for what he has allowed us to enjoy. That 
then is the order of our good works. And we do them with diligence, with great joy. We give with our whole hearts and we do that with passion. When we have opportunities to do ministry here, we do that with great, great passion. We arrive for those meetings very early. We give our all because we are thankful. We are thankful and we are humbled to have an opportunity to be um, co-heirs with Christ. We can now flip the page and meet Philemon. There are a few hard copy Bibles here. The pages flipping were not that many. Nevertheless, we meet these two men, um, Philemon and Onesimus. Let's start with the last one. Onesimus was, um, was a slave of Philemon. We know that. Um, for whatever he owed or whatever he Whatever happened to him, he was not a man of a very high caliber. You know, slaves, they would not even have the privilege of sitting at the table with the masters. They would be cast away. They were just out there serving, obeying everything the master tells you to do, whether you love it or do not like it. Just had a very, you know, like just givenness to a master. And Onesimus does something to his master that gets them to fall out of grace together. They are offended. He is offended. Philemon is offended enough to throw him to prison. And here is where Onesimus meets Paul. Onesimus meets Paul and gets to hear the gospel, as Paul would have himself preach anywhere, anytime to anyone. And by hearing the gospel, Onesimus gets transformed and he becomes a very resourceful person for Paul as a ministry co-worker. Philemon. Philemon is a rich, wealthy, well-to-do guy. The home fellowships, he would host one of them. Believers would meet not in churches or CUs with instruments and all that, but they would meet in people's homes and have fellowship right there. Philemon has enough room. We even hear um, how Paul says that prepare for me a room ahead of time. He, he would even host a ministry workers and colleagues of Paul from time to time. Now Philemon had all rights to throw Onesimus to jail because he was the one who was offended. So obedience in fellowship. This is how Paul speaks about Onesimus as he's making an appeal to Philemon. And Paul does this with a very personal touch. It feels weh. Let's, let us read so that you can see it. So he says from verse 11, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me. And he continues to say uh, the rest. Did you hear Paul saying that Onesimus was his very heart? That he has become very beneficial to him. Paul is struggling to let him go, but wants to, he knows that, okay, fine, I will give him back, I will bring him, send him to you. Onesimus has found great favor and grace with Paul. And he, is, he has become transformed. You can tell that this is true and genuine renewal in their hearts. See how Philemon hears and hears what Paul is saying. Um, <clears throat> formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful to both you and to me. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was so that you may have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Did you hear the one that was offended being told these words? Being told that this guy, I acknowledge he was useless to you, but this useless person that you had before and you threw out in prison, he, has be, he is coming to be useful for both you and me. He is coming back, he is coming back to actually stay longer. He is staying with you forever, literally as long as Paul would have, um, God would have them both live. But also says that you are to handle him as no longer a slave. Onesimus' status has been updated to a dear brother in the faith. 
not a slave of Philemon. His pardon plea. He says, Paul, if he has done any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. It is not, it's, it's the reminder of who did this also for me and you. He paid it in full what was our debt. But hear what Paul is saying that even though you also feel him on, or me, maybe calling it truth or something, but he says that he would dare to take up Onesimus' debt if that would grant that he would be seen as a brother by Philemon. And 17 says, now this is very heavy. If you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Now, Philemon, think about the, the baggage he has to work through to even get to this place of obeying and doing even more than Paul is asking. He is basically going to receive someone who was formerly useless. You know a few people who you have rendered in your head are useless, not useful for anything. He's going to receive him and to stay with him for a really, really long time. Imagine that discomfort and the and the endurance that they will have to build with that and you're not going to treat him as a former useless person he is actually a brother right now in fact i would call you to handle him as you would me paul is saying you know there are people in your life that you esteem if you if you saw them you'd be very happy you'd be very humble you'd be very glad when, when they're here you'd be very humble right paul is saying you're going to treat Feel Onesimus with the same amount of grace and you know and of favor that you would me because he is my son in the faith and I know that he will even do more. Onesimus has, to work, has, has come back as a transformed person yet Philemon has to do the harder work of seeing that true transformation that God has worked on this man's life and accepting and embracing him for works of service and continuity in fellowship together. Does this actually um, remind you of a point in your, in your life where you've had to forgive or being invited to forgive someone? What would you do if God actually forgive them? What would you do if you actually found them in heaven? That you've been holding it so hard in your heart, they are wasteful and useless in according to your perspective. That you are to even be called to treat them with eagerness, to serve them generously and do even more for them. What an invitation. So as we come to the end, grace leading to obedience is an invitation to consider how does sound doctrine and knowing the character of God affect our lives in the way we are privately, in the way we are publicly, in the way we associate with each other, in the way we even uh, unpack the baggages of our hearts that does knowing the character of God affect you that much? And we're being reminded that one, we have received salvation as a privilege. I insist, a privilege, not something that could ever get, not something we could ever purchase, aside from Christ who gave his life for us. And obedience may not always be easy, but his grace abounds. His grace will constantly abound for you. So whatever it is that you are being invited to, he says his grace has appeared teaching you to say no, to lay those things down, even if it does not, like, if you don't feel it completely down today, you could press on in it. And, and this obedience is not a destination that we arrive and, oh, now we are obedient, but it's a continued work as God keeps the rebirth of our hearts continuing. So obedience, God has given each of us grace. It is enough for what you need. It is enough for the forgiveness that you need to give. It is enough for the cultivating of your personal, 
private life, it is enough for every little bit that we desire. Because God never lies. And his hand is never too short. He does not see your struggle and think, maybe you are just past my level. God's grace is sufficient. Our obedience is an act of thankfulness and of humility that will over the time of our staying in it, it shows the doctrine that which we profess, it is seen in our lives. From the people who see our closed doors to the people who only see our charisma and other impressive characteristics that they can tell about us, our obedience is supposed to win them over to God. Truly, for very many people, it is possible to live a life where people only see you in admiration, and it is okay. The problem is not the external admiration. The problem is when it is mechanical. The problem is when your private life has nothing like that. The problem is when, when you come to service, you are happy and excited, but you're not happy and excited about God anywhere else. That is the problem. That is the invitation to respond to God's grace, have your inner life ordered in a way that if you are to be watched by the people who are closest to you, they would see your simple acts of faith and they will give glory to our Father. But also that we would adorn the gospel. It may be attractive for our own Lucas that even as we go for flash mob, wanajua what was see you, the ones that live distinguished lives, the ones that do not lie, the ones that are laboring daily to be diligent in their studies, what was see you. Those are the kinds of people that would want to see, that need to see the gospel being attractive, or that they would know God and they would become when they would receive his grace grace and they'll be forgiven in their sin and they will draw closer to him. So as you consider joining Bible study, we are hoping, we trust God that he will help you to stay in obedience to his will, to his desire and to his great purpose. Shall we bow for a word of prayer? As we make this prayer, I'd want to invite any of you who um, is feeling God is inviting them to an obedience that is difficult. They have worked so hard, but it is not working. They are not very sure how do they move beyond that. Just mention it to the Lord. Just mention it to him and pray that he would help you. Pray that he will give you strength. Pray that he will help you trust his grace. Pray that he will help you stay in it, even when it is extremely excruciating. Pray that God will give you help. For those that are among us that are feeling they are walking in obedience, but it's it's hard. There's somebody they need to forgive. But the feeling it's going to be difficult. Just pray. Mention that person to the Lord. Oh, that He will help you to make to make this, to make that move to respond to Him in obedience. Mention it to the Lord. For those of us that will be here, and this is the first or oh, that's your hearing about this kind of God who helps people to like fight the new world and regeneration in their hearts and you desire that. You can just shoot your hand up and if you want to have a fellowship and a communion with this kind of God, just raise your hand up, we'll be able to pray together. If you want to have a fellowship, if you want to say, to start believing, to walk in salvation, just shoot your hand up, we'll pray together. So trust the Lord for your wellness. Thank you for the hands that are going up. Thank you for the hands that are going up. You desire that your life would model obedience to God. Thank you for the hands that are going up. We see them, we see them. Thank you for the hands that keep, keep them going up. You're just here and your only interest is that you may have a life that obeys God and honors Him in this way. Just thank you for the hands up there. May the Lord remember you and hear you. Just keep making the prayer to the Lord in whichever way He has convinced you. Just respond back to Him in prayer and ask that He would help you to make this conscious journey of knowing Him and loving Him and obeying Him as long as you shall live and that He will make you, give you help and strength for all that He invites you to. Eternal Lord, we thank you for your goodness abounds upon us. Oh Lord, we thank you that while we were yet sinners, 
as Christ died for us, not because of anything that we had deserved, not because of anything we would ever give, but because of your great mercy which was given us, O oh Lord, at the cross where Christ was, was slain, where our burdens were put on him, where our torment was given. And Lord, we praise you for this. We thank you for the hearts that are going up, the ones that are desirous to have a fellowship with you, to have a communion yielding them, helping them to yield to you in obedience as you have invited us. Oh, may your mercy be sure for their lives. Oh, may your grace abound for them, oh God. Oh, may they be constantly assured of your salvation, dear Father, and that you would help them as they journey in the walk of salvation, that, Lord, they would trust you, that they would honor you, and that your name would be revealed in their lives. We pray for some of us here who are desiring to start walking in obedience, who are struggling with things that, Lord, they have not yet laid down, who are battling with the pressures around them that are causing them to dishonor you, dear Lord. And I pray for them, oh, that your mercy will abound in their hearts, oh, that your favor will be with them as well, as you keep them a fount of your grace, as you keep them a fount that you are their refuge and their strength, a very present help in any time of need, oh, that they will run to you and they will find help for this present day, oh, that they will honor you, dear Father. Be yeah, thankful, Lord, even for the opportunities that we have to hear your word and respond in obedience. For some of us, we need to forgive people who would rather not, who would rather they stay wicked, we would rather they stay away from us. They probably look wasteful and useless, but Lord, the invitation to forgive them is clear today. And we pray, oh Lord, as we journey through you, as we journey with you, would you help us? Would you help us lay down anything that may hold us back from giving them generously, even serving them with great esteem, submitting to them out of reverence of Christ to one another? I pray, O oh Lord, that you would keep our hearts from the deceptions of the enemy whose work is to kill, to steal, and to destroy, to lure away the flock of Christ. Oh, that but as a, as a sheep, O oh Lord, would hear your voice with great clarity and with resounding truth, O oh God. I pray that every time that we sit down together in fellowship and hear your word, O oh Lord, that Father will be ignited to greater works, will be reminded of your goodness, we will be helped that we will not even follow the enemy's voice, or oh, that your voice will be very familiar to our hearts, or oh, that we would hear you daily, or oh, that we will find you truly and find the great richness of walking in obedience to you. We pray for those that have been looking at us, Lord, Lord that we may not have shown them the truth of the gospel, the attraction of it, even the beauty of walking in you. Oh, would you forgive us, dear Father, and grant us, O oh Lord, a newness of heart, that, Lord, in the things that we endeavor to do, even starting now and to the rest of the week and the days ahead, until you call us home, would you find us faithful in our service to you, in our good works, in our diligence, there is no integrity, O oh Lord, to keep us in courage that we may live out in this godliness, O oh God. We pray that, Lord, would you use, also be pleased to use our lives to testify to others that you are good and you are kind, to show them your character, even to reveal yourself to them. Pray that you would help us to stay obedient to you. We desire that, Lord, as as the time draws nigh, we would hear your voice calling, welcome, good and faithful servants. I pray that that will be said of each of us in the very things that we do, the darkness and the light, but Lord, even in the stewardship of our hearts and the things you have invited us to obey. May your spirit guide us and lead us in all truth that indeed we will walk with you truly. And we pray this in the name of the Lord our Father, and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much um, for sitting down. For those who have um, um, asked to, who are raising their hands, please just come to the pastor's desk. See any of the leaders. Let's stand together. You're not obeying in isolation. We are in this together. May the Lord bless us and have us have a good week ahead. Thank you.